Well, let's go ahead and stand and open our Bibles, please, to the book of Titus, chapter 1. And, and I'd like to welcome those joining us via the internet. Uh, which camera? Would the, be that one right there, that little white one would be, is that what's shooting the internet? Not the one above it. It's that one right there, okay. Well, hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> those millions of you that are watching, but no, seriously, welcome. We're going through the book of Titus, and this morning we're going to begin in verse 5 of chapter 1 and go to, we'll see how far we get. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, these are the qualifications now for elders, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop or a pastor or an elder must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, and then on a more positive side, verse 8, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound or healthy good teaching both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the, tr the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Well, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can uh, bring ourselves to you. And again, we pray for those with heavy hearts today and ask for grace and power to enable uh, to trust you and to hope in you because you're faithful and there is an end to these times of uh, distress. Lord, we thank you also for the Bible. It's the truth, and it just washes us, it clarifies, it straightens our thinking out, it challenges us, it guides us, it reproves and convicts us and strengthens. And so thank you for what you do through the living bread of the Word of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, Lord, we pray if there is anyone in this room this morning who has yet to be forgiven of their sins. They're still, they don't know you yet. They know about you. Lord, would you please open their eyes today, bring your loving conviction into their lives that they might see Christ and come to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, Titus was a pastor uh, he was actually an associate of Paul's. They had uh, traveled together. It's quite possible, and I think it's true, that Titus was led to Christ through Paul's ministry. And um, at one point in their traveling ministry together, they were both on the island of Crete, a place known as the, uh, the island of a hundred cities, a small little island in the Mediterranean, but heavily populated. And isolated really from the rest of the world, and I think that's part of why the description of what those people are like is why they're like that. 
But um, Paul and Titus had begun the work. Paul had to leave, so he left Titus there to finish the things that needed to be finished. And so what we're going to look at this morning is this matter of the importance of um, appointing elders in every city. So it wasn't just one church. There were multiple churches that had uh, been um, founded, but they needed to be nurtured. They needed to grow into the proper uh, organization of a church. And uh, one of the reasons for the need uh, for good godly leaders is because of how troubled those people were. I mean, uh, and we're talking about Christians now. They had been brought up in this society, and they were the Christians were being influenced by the pagans around them. And so Paul said, look, we need leaders to get in there and help get things straightened out and organized. So we'll, you'll see as we go. Verse 5, for this reason, I left you in Crete. And here's why I left you that you should, number one, set in order the things that are lacking or complete the work there. And then secondly, and appoint elders in every city as I had commanded you. So Paul was very clear, reminding Timothy Titus, look, this is the reason, you remember when we were there together, this is the reason that I left you there. You need to complete the work. You need to set in order the things that are lacking. And then also, it's your responsibility to appoint the elders. Now, what he's going to do is to give Titus, beginning in verse 6, a list of 17 qualifications that he would look for in the life of a man who would be an elder. But I want to just develop a, a thought here with you, and then we'll go on through the rest of this chapter this morning. But think with me for a moment, okay? Okay. God had spoken to the Apostle Paul, who had been given authority with the other apostles to be able to command people to do things. And so God had spoken to Paul. Paul spoke to Titus. And Paul told Titus, this is what God wants you to do. And Titus, being submitted to God and submitted to the Apostle Paul, uh, he had been mentored by Paul. He willingly uh, took the responsibility that was given to him. So if you'd asked Titus, hey, what's the reason you're here? He would say, well, there's two reasons I'm here. One, there's some things that need to be set in order. And two, I have a responsibility among my pastoral duties, and aside from those, to find and appoint elders. So t Titus is a man who knew what God wanted him to do. Isn't that nice? And he was doing, and he was attempting to do what God wanted him to do. Now, it's also a blessing for any Christian if you were to be able to ask them, hey, what is the reason that God has you where you are? What, what is it that he's doing in your life? What is it that he, he has commanded you to do? What, what is it that God has for you? be great to be able to answer that, wouldn't it? Now, sometimes, uh, to be very candid, of course, um, some Christians wouldn't even care about that. Well, hey, I don't care about that. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and that's all I care about. There's a lot of people like that. Other people might say, well, you know, I've never really thought about. You're talking about what is God's will for my... Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Well, you know, I've never really considered what God might want me to do. Then there would be other people that say, yes, I, I've discovered my spiritual gifts, and, and I, I'm pretty darn sure this is where I'm supposed to be, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so people are at various places with respect to the matter of, what is the reason God has you where you are? What is it that God has you doing? These are things that maybe can't, they can't be answered in a moment necessarily, but for the person who's interested in knowing, here's an example of someone who found out 
and you can find out as well. And a life lived in the accomplishment of God's purposes is a life well lived. And it's a life, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pleasing to God and it's the most pleasing life you could ever have. So just a, an encouragement to you, if you uh, want to look further on your own, you might look to Romans chapter 12 where Paul says, look, now that God has been so merciful, why don't you just give yourself over to him? You be humble. Don't be prideful. You know, you're just one of many. Uh, you have spiritual gifts, and he lists a bunch of spiritual gifts, and he says, now, use your spiritual gifts. And so it's a very simple deal where God is calling any Christian to himself, and he says, this is what I want you to do. This our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So one thing that uh, can creep into a church is that it's the professionals, the staff people, the pastors, the, you know, they're the ones who do all of this. No, 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 no. We are all, like, we are all members of the body of Christ. Um, there's more to me than just this handsome face. Uh, I have a neck, <laughs> I have a chest, I have organs. Uh, they're all part of my body, and if I was missing one of them, you say, well, there's a little bit of emptiness up here. Okay, see, I know, I, I can tell you from experience. If you're missing one of them, it, it's, there's a void. You are a Christian. You have the privilege, the opportunity to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And a mature believer ought to be able to say, you know, this is what God has me doing. These are the kind of gifts that he's given me, and this is what I do for the Lord. That's how he works through my life. So, great example. So, real quickly, just kind of going through this list of qualifications, which, of course, Paul had mentioned 15 of these same qualifications to Timothy in his um, first uh, letter to Timothy, but for Titus... He gives 17, and he doesn't mention anything about deacons or deaconesses. But I did want to say one thing. At the end of verse 5, he says, um, and appoint elders. Now, he didn't say, um, have people vote on who the elders would be. He said, have them to be appointed. Just another little quick thought. You know, in the New Testament, there is no specific organizational flow chart that is given to us as to how a church is to be governed. There just isn't. So consequently, uh, if you visited five churches, you could find five different types of governance. But what is clear in the scripture is that those who lead need to be people of good character. In fact, in all of the 17 qualifications here, uh, you won't really find much about teaching or functioning with gifts. It has to do with good character. So when you have people who are called by God, they meet these qualifications, whatever form of church governance they have, it'll do just fine. There is no form of church governance that is uh, something that's going to prevent difficulty, corruption, sin, etc., what will prevent those things are the people who lead the church if they are men and women of integrity. So just a kind of an interesting point. Um, but in verse 6, he begins to list these. And I'm not going to spend too much time on all these. But first of all, if a man is blameless. Well, now that would just knock everybody out of the deal, wouldn't it? But actually what it means is that he's above reproach. It's... Um, he, he should live a blameless life. And another way of saying it is this. Uh, pastors get accused all the time, but he's saying you live a life so that the accusations can't stick. You can't help them from coming, but there, there shouldn't be anything true about them. So you live a life. They can accuse you all day long, but they'll just fall away eventually. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, to live a life that's above reproach. Secondly, the husband of one wife, uh, meaning that he's to be a man devoted to his wife. And, and again, this doesn't mean that a single man couldn't be a pastor, 
I don't believe that it means a man who was divorced for the proper reasons couldn't be a pastor. Um, but if he is married, he is to be devoted to his wife. He's to be a man that's pure and that he's single-mindedly focused on his wife. Now, the next one is one I have difficulty with, and I think you will too. I'll have to spend a couple of minutes with this. Having faithful children or children who are believers is another way of identifying this. Not accused of dissipation or causing trouble, uh, debauchery or incorrigibility and, or insubordination. So, oh, <laughs> this is a tough one. Let me read it again. He is to have faithful children. His children are to be believers. They can't be accused of dissipation or insubordination. Now, I almost resigned the ministry probably 25 years ago because one of my children was insubordinate. I called a bunch of my pastor friends and I said, we have a problem here. Houston, we have a problem. Uh, not only is my son insubordinate, but I'm having a problem keeping my temper under control with him. And uh, do you think I should quit the ministry because, you know, I'm looking at this? What? And they said, uh, well, no, you shouldn't. And I said, well, okay. And I sought the counsel of several people, and, and they said, uh, you shouldn't. So then you come back to this, and you say, well, but it says right here that you're to have children who are believers. Well, and by the way, this is referring uh, to children who are living under your roof. The best I can make of this is this, that if, if indeed, and, and you're free to disagree with me on this if you like, but if indeed this is saying what it seems to be saying, it might mean that about 95% of the pastors I know should never have become pastors or should resign today. I, I think that the, the common sense understanding of this would be this. Uh, and by the way, this is not referring to children who've left your home. That, that's a different story. They're out of your home. But it, when you're looking in the congregation to appoint an elder... You want to find a man who is able to deal with his children. He's not negligent. He doesn't just close his eyes. He doesn't leave it up to his wife, how, however they work it out together to, to try to nurture their children. Um, if you see a man who's got a child that's insubordinate, is that man seeking to try to kill the boy. No, no, I mean, uh, no, no, that's what you'd want to do, right, at that moment. Hey, don't look so smug out there, okay? Give me a break. Uh, and get your humor, uh, you know, thing up there to catch the good, you, you miss that. You don't put your antenna up, you miss a lot around here. So, is the man attempting to, and also, What's the whole picture in his home? I mean, what if he has two children? What if he has three children? What if he has four children? Uh, what if they're all insubordinate? Is he dealing with them or not? What if he's got just one bad one? What if he's got a prodigal one? So I'll leave the final interpretation up to you. I can't argue with you on this. It, it's troubling to me because I personally have uh, my... I will, I have a, I can really, never mind, I could write a book about this. It's no joke, it's, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of difficulty involved in these things, but I guess the bottom line for me is, you're looking for elders, uh, is the guy got his head in the clouds or in the sand, his kids are going crazy, he's doing nothing about it, or is he trying? In our case, we tried, 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 and had to put our second son at the age of 15 or 16 out of our home. We just couldn't take it anymore. It was either our home was going to be destroyed or, or he had to go. So we tried everything we knew to deal with him. And eventually we had to, and we sent him off to a family member. We paid money to take care of him. He never to this day knows 
that we paid for all that. So that's something we did in that particular case. Let's move on. Verse 7. For a bishop, and again, that's just another term for pastor, elder, etc. A bishop must be blameless. So he's repeating that. So you begin to get the idea, pastors, elders need to be men of integrity. Not perfect people, nobody is, but men of integrity. Do they have failures? Of course they do. Uh, is there accountability? Hopefully. He must be blameless as a steward of God. We Elders are entrusted with God, entrusted by God. Then he goes on, not self-willed. It can't be the kind of person who always, dem or just demands their own way. That, that's the way they are. There needs to be a, a cooperative spirit, a willingness to work together with other people, not a one-man show my way or the highway, not quick-tempered, not good when <laughs> pastors lose their temper. Uh, one time I was having a bad morning at the office over here, and uh, my phone, for some reason, the phone was on the floor, and the, the uh, thing was in the cradle, and... and um, Something had just happened. I talked to somebody. It was some difficult conversation. And so I was, I was getting, I was, I just kicked my phone. And as, as I was kicking my phone, Pastor Mike opened the door and walked in. And I just said, well, well it's just, I'm having trouble with this leg, Mike. It's just <laughs> kind of doing things on its own. <laughs> no, I didn't tell him that. I uh, had a issue one time with an elder sitting right over there and he kind of started to lose his cool a little bit, and I wanted to take his head off. I mean, you know, it's just, but we can't do that kind of thing. It's just not good. You have to learn how to not be quick-tempered. It means, and believe me, pastors have a lot to be angry about. They're having to deal with people. So, but what's being said here is, Okay, that's life, but you got to learn how to control yourself. Don't do what you'd like to do. That's not good leadership. Not given to wine or not a one that sits too long at the wine. Not good. Not violent. Uh, ready to fight. Not greedy for money. A person who's content. They're not in it for the money. They're not being driven by a higher salary or any of that kind of thing. And then on a positive note, but hospitable, uh, willing to help people who are strangers to you. And then a lover of what is good. Just simply loving what is good. Finding a person who is committed to loving what is good. And then sober-minded. Uh, it means that he must live wisely. That's what it is to be sober-minded. That he must be just, holy, or set apart to God. He's living a devout life, a di disciplined life, self-controlled. He's exercising that. And then lastly, there in verse 9, he says, holding fast the faithful word. So after all of these qualifications that deal with character, he for the first time now begins to talk about function and giftedness. And an elder is to hold on to the faithful word, as it's called here, as he has been taught. So what he has been taught, he's to hold on to that. Why? That he may be able, by sound or healthy doctrine or teaching, to do two things. Number one, to exhort or encourage, and number two, to convict those who contradict. Now remember, when he says the word contradict, he's merely describing for Titus, uh, as we're going to see in the other verses that we read there, starting in verse 10, creep. Crete was a horrible place. 
The people there are always liars. They're always lazy. They're gluttons. Even their own prophets have said, these are horrible people. And many of them had gotten saved, and they were still having a hard time. They were so influenced from their upbringing, and then they were being influenced by these Judaizers, who we'll talk about in a moment. So, Titus, you've got to find some good men who know the Word of God. They've been taught. They have the Word of God. They know how to help people so that they can go to these people and that they can uh, encourage them and then convince them that what they're doing and thinking is wrong. So it takes good qualified leaders to go into a disorderly situation like that, and it takes courage to do that. You know, we were just up at uh, Sacramento, and, and as chaplains, we had a meeting, and they said, well, here's what you do with the people who are going to disrupt everything, and they're going to put these signs up and block the views, and they explained how you go up to them and talk to them and ask them to lower their signs, and, and Pastor Mike is excellent at that. He's just got a nice way of help, you know, and I can't do it. I just can't bring myself to do it, believe it or not. And you say, well, as mean as you are, you can't do that? No, that's true. I may not be as mean as you think I am, but I I have trouble doing that. It's just hard for me. Uh, now, if it's something in the Word of God, I don't seem to have a problem saying, well, wait a minute, what you're saying here is a little different. But contradiction to the truth, does it help anybody? No. Getting, the, getting straightened out, does that help? Yeah. So Titus had a job. You, there's things that need to be straightened out there. You have elders that need to be appointed. And, and here's the li- this is what you look for in them. And by the way, you know, we have a group of wonderful elders in this church, don't we? We really do. Um, and as a result of our studies in, in 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy over this last year, uh, we have been applying these scriptures. And I, I'm not sure what the number is of how many elders we have, but I think it's around 15 or something of that nature. And I'm so proud of each one of these men. Just as a Christian, I'm proud of them. I'm, I'm blessed and proud in our church that God is raising people up. Deacons have been raised up. Deaconesses have been raised up. And, and really, a church is not a real church until it has defined, constituted leaders. And um, so the first order of business given to Titus. You get the leadership in place. And then in verse 10, in explaining the challenges that lay ahead, and some have called these offenders in the church. These are the type of people that Titus had to deal with. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Here's how the New Living Translation reads. For there are many (laughs) rebellious people. Titus, you got a lot of rebels in your congregation. Oh, great. They engage in useless talk. Their talk is just useless. It, It doesn't accomplish anything. And they're deceiving other people. Not knowingly, but they themselves have been deceived. So that's the problem right there in the church insubordinate, rebellious people. Have you ever met rebellious people in a church? Have you? I have. I've been pastoring here a long time, I can tell you. We, we bury them out back in that <laughs> unused portion. No, but um, here's been my experience. You know, we sing to the Lord about our love for Him, and we read the Bible, and we believe it. And then when we start talking about, you know, if you're offended, what do you do? Uh, Then we start talking, we read in the Bible that we're to be in submission to those in leadership. And, you know, all those kinds of things that we all believe in. And everybody's happy until a leader has to go to someone like these people and say, wait a minute, you know, can we... Here's, could we talk with you about 
what you did, what you said. Here's what the Bible says. And it's at that very moment, depending on the attitude of that person, and we're assuming that the explanation has been given in love, it's at that very moment that almost, almost all the time, that person will not practice what they have believed in about being open and willing to take some counsel and some correction. And um, that's just the way it is. So we call that practice what you preach, right? So this was a serious matter. I mean, Titus knew what he was in for. He had been there, and Paul's reminding him, Tim, Titus, you've got some real troublemakers uh, in that church. They're, they're idle talkers. They, they sit around and do nothing. And, uh, and on top of that, they're deceiving people. That would be terrible. Especially those of the circumcision. So there were, there were different kinds of false doctrine, but here he isolates one, especially those of the circumcision, which is essentially they were saying, look, to be saved, you have to know Christ and follow the Old Testament law or some portion of it. You have to be circumcised. They were trying to mix the Old Testament law with the New Covenant, when in fact the New Testament says that the New Covenant is new because the Old One it doesn't, it's not in play anymore. It's the New Covenant. And so they were coming into churches where you have people that are already rebellious, they're already insubordinate, they're already, you know, not very healthy, and somebody's coming along with a, a new doctrine that's not true, and... And when people are not rooted and grounded, they'll easily become uh, victims of false doctrine. You hear about this all the time from the Bible, and the reason you do is because we're living, this is the war that we're in. It's a war of truth and error, truth and lies. We have an active enemy. Satan is not, doesn't work Monday through Friday and take the weekends and holidays off. He's a 24-7 guy with all of his angels. This is a spiritual battle that we're in. And the, the centerpiece is the truth who is Jesus Christ, the Savior, and we're saved by grace through faith. Every other religion says, oh yeah, that's good, believe in Jesus, but you also have to do, you have to be baptized, you have to do this, you have to, they start laying all these extra biblical rules, and it's wrong. What you need to be saved is to know Jesus Christ personally, very simple. In verse 11, he says, whose mouths must be stopped. Titus, you can't let these people just keep going. They have, they have to stop talking like this. Why? Who subvert whole households. They get into somebody's house, and, and if they're good communicators, they have some charisma, maybe they're respected in general by the people there, the people are... Uh, willing to listen to them. And what happens is, through that false doctrine, rather than building them up, it subverts everything. It destroys everything. Turns people's relationships into a legalistic relationship. I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that, instead of a loving relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Loving Him, walking in obedience to Him, but nonetheless focused on Him loving him. We're saved through him, not by anything we've done. They subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not. They, did, they shouldn't be doing this. So, Titus, you can't let them do that. And they're doing it for the sake of dishonest gain. Taking offerings that they should, didn't, shouldn't have done that. One of them, verse 12 a prophet of their, of, of their own, one of their own people, spokesman. Here's what he said. Cretans are always liars. So, boy, you wouldn't want to go strike a business deal with anybody there, would you? They're, <laughs> I like this next one. They're evil beasts. Yikes. They're like cruel animals. They're always lying. They're like cruel animals. 
And on top of that, they're lazy. They won't work. They won't do anything. What a, let's, take a, tr- let's take a cruise to Crete. What do you think? <laughs> like a Mediterranean cruise to the beautiful island of Crete. And we could say, hey, we're looking for some liars and e- lazy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There's another little place in the Mediterranean called Malta, which is the exact opposite of this. Oh, that's... That's such a beautiful place. Verse 13, Paul says, This testimony, the testimony of one of their own prophets, it is true. Therefore, so Titus, it's what's going on there, it's true. Therefore, here's what you need to do. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Reprimand, Reprimand them sternly is the idea. It's a serious matter. I mean, I've been reprimanded by my pastor once or twice or three or five dozen times. No, I've been, I've had a couple of calls from Pastor Chuck when he was down here. I've gone to see him a couple of times at his request. And um, it's not pleasant to be reproved or rebuked. Uh, He was one of the nicer men I know who can do that kind of thing. Um, I remember one time he called me on the phone and he was disconcerned about something and, and the whole while while he's talking to me, I'm thinking, it's too bad you're not as smart as I am because I, I really know about this matter. And he's just, and I'm saying, yes, mm-hmm, and I'm thinking, oh my, terrible, isn't it? How ignorant, pridefully ignorant we can be. When I got straightened around on that and realized what had happened, I apologized to him, and he said, oh, no problem. And then when I'd see him next, I'd say, Pastor Chuck, I, I'm so sorry about it. I just, I hated to trouble you, take your time, and he said, Bob, don't even give it a second thought. And So I apologized to him about four times over the next year, whenever I saw him, and because I felt so bad. So when then we're on the phone on some other matter, and I said, oh, you know, Chuck, I wanted to apologize. He said, oh, oh, oh. He said, stop or I'm going to rebuke you again. No, he didn't. (laughs) He just said, Bob, he said, that is over and done with. We don't need to discuss that anymore. And I said, okay, (laughs) I love you and thank you. So, but nonetheless, this is a serious matter. Titus, you need to go in there and rebuke these people who are saying things that are not true. It's not an easy job. Generally speaking, they're going to think, you're the one with the problem, not me. That could be a little bit of both. But just in this context here, rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. The whole purpose of this kind of ministry would be to bring somebody out of false doctrine into healthy doctrine so that they're sound in the faith. How would that occur? Well, verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables. Don't be listening to Jewish fables and commandments of men, ideas that have come up with from men who turn, uh, commandments of men who turn from the truth. And, And it's so interesting that if it isn't Jewish fables or some other commandment, it, it's something. There's, there are always these winds of doctrine. There always will be until the people who, the, the, the angels who promote these winds of doctrine are no longer able to do it when they're in custody forever in the lake of fire. So until that happens, there always will be these uh, things that turn from the truth. And then he describes the people there a little bit more, having told them to that, look, you've got to stop listening to these Jewish myths. We we have a family in our congregation who um, some woman started talking to the the wife and then her friend and and uh, before you know it, they're they're starting to question the, the Christianity and they're wanting to go back into Judaism. And uh, it was not an easy thing to try to bring some light there. 
But in verse 15, interesting, he says to the pure, to the person who is not a liar, not a lazy person, not, you know, etc. To the pure, all things are pure. A pure person lives life through that lens. They're Sure, they're tempted and all of that, and yes, they fail and they sin, but their, their life is lived through that. All things are pure. They're living a pure life. Um, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, so that's a little bit different now than the believers, those who have become defiled by the way they're living and then they're unbelieving, to those kind of people, nothing is pure. They themselves are defiled. They themselves don't believe God. And for them, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. Now you're getting uh, an, an a, auto, a spiritual autopsy. Their mind and their conscience are defiled. I mean, they've you know, got an evil conscience. Going on describing these people, they profess to know God. Yes, I know, I know, not just that I know about him, I actually know him. They would say, I know him, just like you would say you know him. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Pretty simple, isn't it? Your life's actions either validate your confession of faith or they prove that you don't have faith. Your faith in God is evidenced by the way that you live. Not, and again, not, none, nobody's perfect, but a Christian lives a different way. So they profess to know God, but in works they deny him. That would be another challenge for Titus. Going in, talking to people, oh yeah, I know the Lord. I mean, how often does that happen when you're trying to witness to somebody? A lot. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I know the Lord. And then you realize they're sleeping around, they're living with somebody, you know, uh, and that kind of thing, or whatever it is. In the middle part of verse 16, and we'll end with this last portion of verse 16, but starting there in the middle, it says, being abominable or detestable is the meaning. I'm telling you folks, don't go to Crete, okay? It was a bad place. But really, because of love, God's love, go to Crete, <laughs> God sent Paul there. He sent Titus there. All this description is merely a description of reality, but the greater reality is the love of God coming into an island with a hundred cities to bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ by pushing back the, the lies. And, you know, what does light do? What does, it light, what does light do to darkness? It helps it to go away, doesn't it? It makes it go away. And so, these detestable people, loved by God, just as much as anybody, even the undetestable are loved by God. Let me ask you this. Do you think you might have been detestable in anybody's eyes before you were saved? Were you lazy? Were you a liar? <laughs> were you an evil beast? I don't see many hands going up, but I'm sure that there, we could all say, yeah, I can hang on a couple of those, <laughs> or all of them. I remember once when I, my friend Raul Reese, whom I knew to some degree, I heard him give his testimony in a greater way than I'd ever heard it before, and he was such a, uh, he had such a terrible past, I thought, man, I don't think I'm ever going to have anything to do with that guy again. Um, but thank God he saved him. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, look, such were some of you. People are sinners. But God will save you. God will wash you. God will make you right with him. 
Nobody is beyond the reach of God. God loves those detestable people as much as he loves anyone else. So being abominable, and then again disobedient, he mentions that, and disqualified for every good work. What a <laughs> pretty tough situation. In verse 1 of chapter 2, I just want to just touch this just to show you. He begins now to move away from describing the people. He described the qualifications for elders. And now he begins to talk about the duties, Titus, in the church, what you need to be saying. He says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. In contrast to false teachers, that is, they teach lies. You need to teach healthy teaching. That which causes behavior to be in accord with belief. In verse 2, he says that the older men, and then in verse 3, the older women. In verse 9, he talks about servants. In verse 4, he talks about young women in their home. In verse 3, he talks about older women. He talks about not stealing from your employer in verse 10. And then in verse 11, he tells us, this is how we should respond to the grace of God. And, and he goes and gives great, great, uh, de this is a beautiful little three-chapter epistle, so we're just breaking into it right now. But can I uh, uh, close by saying, for all of us, might we continually be asking the Lord, what is it that you want me to do for you? What is your will for me? What are, what are the good works which you've planned out for me to do? And what do you think God will do? Do you think he'll be happy with you? Of course he would. He'd be thrilled. I mean, just think like if it ever happened when you had kids and they got up on Saturday morning and said, hey, mom and dad, what would you like me to do this morning? You'd say, well, after I am picked up off the floor from this heart attack, I've got just a couple of things. No? <laughs> How pleased are our parents when uh, their children are like that? And what a blessing it is to the Lord when he sees a, one of his own children saying, God, I need your help. Can't do this on my own. I, I've got to make plenty of mistakes. But down deep, I want to do what's right with you. Not quite sure what you want me to do, but would you show me? And the Bible says if we knock and keep knocking and ask and keep asking and seek and keep seeking, those things are going to work out just fine. God wants to speak to every one of his children and give direction. He is our good shepherd who leads us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the elders we have in our body, the deacons that you've raised up, the deaconesses. Thank you so much, Lord, for these fine, fine people. It just, it, it does, it makes us as a congregation um, comforted and, and, it, and we have a respect for these people and we thank you for them. And, and Lord, we pray that as a, as a body, we would be a family that would seek to have love be the guiding commandment in our relationships with one another. Forgive us, O oh God, for our many, many uh, missteps. Thank you that you don't condemn us. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing here at Calvary Chapel. We pray for Franklin Graham, Lord, as he's only been to 13 of the 50 states that he's going to, that he would be strengthened. Uh, whatever pressure this is putting on his marriage, uh, please help them to be united. And Lord, as he's casting out the seed of your word around all 50 states, and we were the blessed recipients to hear the word of God and a call to 
set our lives apart. Help us to linger carefully thinking through these matters. And Father, as we receive now from your people your tithe and offerings, uh, we're bringing them to you out of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.